This is my current project. It's a small oscillator project which is eventually going to be the heart of a radio transmitter. However, I have a challenge, and the challenge is that I want this to be able to tune a very wide range of frequencies. A lot of simple transmitters use crystals, which can very stably produce one frequency, which is good. However, I want to tune a range of frequencies. A range of frequencies can usually be accomplished using a variable capacitor, like this one. This is a large variable capacitor that can produce somewhere between 20 and 200 picofarads. You can see as I turn the knob these plates come closer together and farther apart. Those plates are not contacting each other. They're actually very, very close together and having those metal plates in such close approximation uh, allows them to develop some capacitance. So this is an easy way to have a large amount of capacitance that can be varied, but this variable capacitor is extremely expensive. Well, not extremely, but this would be by far the most expensive component in any radio that I would make. So I'm trying to stay away from hardware capacitors like that. The alternative is to use something called a Vericap diode, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the concept is that if you run electricity over a diode backwards, it produces a small amount of capacitance. And I can demonstrate that here. Here is a potentiometer, which will let me adjust how much voltage I put backwards against this diode. And this is the frequency readout. Using this method, I can change frequency from about 6.8 megahertz to around 6.95 megahertz. And that's great for a lot of applications, but I desire even more than that. And uh, the method that I found doesn't rely on using a variable capacitor, but rather a variable inductor. Before I get into how it works, let's talk about the circuit, which is shown here. Now, the circuit is a pretty simple oscillator stage here. The oscillator is a Colpitz oscillator. If you look up what a Colpitz oscillator is as compar compared to a Hartley oscillator, they're very similar, except the Colpitz has two capacitors here and here, and the Hartley, instead of having these two capacitors, they have a center tap on this inductor that goes to the ground, or goes to the uh, source of the FET here. The purpose of these components is to produce a phase shift or an inversion to allow it to oscillate, but I won't get into the details. The key to know is that this region generates a sine wave, and the frequency of the sine wave is dependent on two things, the value of this inductor and the value of this capacitor. This capacitor is commonly used as a variable capacitor, like the one I showed earlier, and that's an easy way to change frequency a large amount, but I want to investigate using a variable inductor. The Vericap diode I talked about it can be seen here. Here we have an LED, and this is backwards. You would normally see an LED going the other direction. But if you hook it up in this configuration and apply a little bit of, of DC voltage backwards to it, this acts like a small capacitor. And it lets me vary capacitance by about 20 picofarads just by turning the potentiometer. So far, all of this is very inexpensive components. And then um, this goes through a buffer stage, which takes this very delicate sine wave and amplifies it. So I can easily measure the output here and I'm not going to affect the sine wave very much. Whereas if I tried to do a lot of amplification or measurement over here, it might distort the sine wave. So this circuit is what I've built over here. And this large thing is the variable inductor. And this is what I did. This is pretty simple. I took a McDonald's straw. You like the puppies there? Yeah. Pretend that didn't happen. I took a McDonald's straw like this and I wrapped it with wire similar to this. Now this is a clear straw. Let's see if I can get it in focus. But when it's wrapped many, many times with wire like that, it forms an inductor. And unlike a core inductor, like this one, which has a core of um, iron or a ferrite, powdered iron, or different types of cores, this one just uses air. And there's some benefits and disadvantages for each of these. However, I wound a McDonald's straw many times, similar to this, but a lot longer, to form an inductor. And I placed it right there, and I encapsulated the entire thing in hot glue to hold the wires in place and also to make sure it's very uh, temperature thermally isolated. Now, the thing I did at the end, pretend that this is wrapped with wire, I took a nut and I actually hot glued the nut to the straw like this. So I can turn the screw and the screw goes in and out. As the screw goes in and out, it actually changes the inductance of that inductor. It makes it more or less efficient. And hopefully I can demonstrate for that, demonstrate that for you right now. So I'm going to 
slowly insert the screw. Once I get it going, I'm going to insert the screw, and you can watch the frequency. I'm going to turn the potentiometer all the way down, so there's its lowest frequency. And remember, we could tune from 6.8 to maybe a couple hundred kilohertz higher. So I'm going to slowly enter the screw, and we will see what happens. I'd like to thank uh, Alan Yates, by the way. Alan Yates has a really neat website, and he gave me the idea for this by looking at his website. He did something very similar. Now, as I screw the screw in, you can see the frequency is going up tremendously, and if I let go, it's pretty stable. It's, it's not very, uh, very touchy. So I can go way up to 6.7, 6.8. That's about 1 megahertz of frequency change, over 1 megahertz, that I can do just by moving the screw in and out. So let's say that even though this inductor naturally is, um, resonates at a frequency below what I want, which is about 6.8, let's say I desire 6.12, that's something I can accomplish almost completely just by turning the screw. And before I get to six or 7.12, I will show you one more thing. I have a small piece of wire here, which I clamp onto the screw to ground it so it doesn't change when I touch it. And with that being said, I can insert the screw a little bit more, and I can get pretty close. And the fine-tuning I can still do with my Veracap diode and the potentiometer, although it was turned all the way down. should probably make it less sensitive. All right, there you go. 7.2000 as seen. And I can hook up the oscilloscope, and the oscilloscope's actually already hooked up. We can look at its image, and we can see pretty clear sine waves. Turn the backlight down. All right. You can see the sine waves. They're not perfect. I could probably tweak some of those values a little bit. Alright, so it's 7.7.2. I'll come over to a radio and see what it sounds like. Okay, I had a little bit of a problem with temperature stability because the device was out on a on this table and it was having air blown on it and it's very temperature sensitive. So I put it in this box. This box could be something really, really small. Just build the oscillator in its own box and you'll probably be okay. But this is the frequency. And we'll come over here. And we should be able to hear. It's a lot more stable. It's still changing slightly because the temperature is changing inside the box here. But it's just to show that it is stable as long as it's temperature stable. And that's a big component of the variability. Another thing I want to comment on is the type of wire I'm using. This isn't just standard copper wire. This is called magnet wire. It's wire that instead of having a Teflon or some type of rubber coating, actually has an enamel coating. And this enamel is non-conductive, so it allows the wire to touch each other without shorting. At the ends, it's silver. That's where I melted the wire with the soldering iron. The enamel, the enamel of this type of wire melts off with the soldering iron, so it's really easy to use. I use it as uh, magnet wire for inductors, of course, but also for jumpers. If you remember this frequency project, the whole back of it is nothing but a huge heap of, of this type of green wire. So it's very convenient because you don't have to strip wires, but don't try to wind an inductor using standard wire. It has to be a magnet wire or some type of coated wire.